Good morning, everyone. Sorry we're starting a little bit late, but thank you very much for joining us. Um, so happy to be back in Perugia. It's amazing to be here. So I'm Garrett Goodman. I'm with Watch It. Um, for those of you who don't know what Watch It is, we're a video creation platform. And we're used by 550 media brands around the world that make over 30,000 videos a month with our platform. And what that means is that we get to see inside the video operations of all these top media companies. And one of the things that we really like to do as a company is share those best practices. So I'm really excited to have Hannah Ray here with me today. Um, we met at the beginning of the Watch It Connie Nass International Partnership. And um, she's gone on to just do really amazing things with the Instagram Stories format. So I'm going to share a couple of stats on Instagram to help uh, kind of lay the groundwork so everybody can knows where we stand. And then hand it over to Hannah uh, to do an introduction. And we decided that we'd gather kind of three specific examples that she could talk through with you guys um, to show how they're addressing the Instagram audience and how they're doing it at a global kind of multilingual level. Um, so. The first stat I have for you guys is about how many people are using Instagram stories because it's a pretty new format. But there are, by the last count, 300 million daily active users of Instagram stories. And that's out of 500 million total daily active users on Instagram. So it's a hugely popular format. And this actually is a very different format than other types of social video. And one stat that really illustrates that for me is that actually 60% of the videos that are viewed on Instagram are viewed with the sound on, which is almost the inverse of the case with Facebook, right? And the last stat is that uh, Instagram audiences are actually coming back to the app 20 times a day. So there's a real opportunity to build a story throughout the day and engage them multiple times within one day even. So it's a really specific format, and I think that it merits kind of a deep dive. So I'm gonna hand it over to Hannah to introduce herself, and we'll get started. So hi everyone, my name's Hannah Ray. I'm super excited to be here, and I'm looking forward to discussing these few examples, um, as Garrett said. Um, here's a picture of me on a trampoline, and then also, uh, to introduce myself a little bit more in a work setting. Um, I actually was, after I was working at The Guardian, I went and worked at Instagram on their community team for three years during a really um, high growth period for the company. Um, and I was writing stories, um, my background's in journalism, and I was creating stories and content about how people were using Instagram, especially in EMEA, and then I helped hire our international team. So a caveat is that, um, I'm not a photojournalist, I haven't worked in advertising. My background's in journalism with a particular passion for how people tell and share stories online and actually how communities come together around those stories. So that's always really driven everything that I do. Um, after I left Instagram, I started freelancing for a little bit and I was approached by Wolfgang Blau, now president of Condé Nast International, to look at the Vogue suite of accounts. So Vogue has something like 43 Instagram accounts. And I was asked to kind of come and look at that and say, you know, what are we doing there and how could we do it better? Um, so that's what landed me to, to actually come and look at Vogue in International, which is actually a very relatively new team. So uh, we have operate in 22 different markets and I'm actually looking at 11 Vogue markets. So you have Vogue Italia, Paris Vogue, um, and then you also have the franchisees, so Vogue Australia. Um, so that's a lot of Vogues, right? And that's a lot of Instagram accounts. Um, so that was the challenge, was to kind of look at that and say, well, what are we doing? And all these accounts had sprung up in different ways by different editorial teams with very different strategies. So I was coming at it from a very objective point of view, but from this very editorial point of view as well, and kind of looking at why, why we were doing things in the way we were and how could we improve as a suite of accounts for Vogue. Um, so that's my kind of uh, career journey so far. And I guess your question as well might be, well, your question, Garrick, maybe you want to ask it. <laughs> I've got a question for you. <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, you, it's interesting to note you were one of the first four hires into this Vogue International team, which I think sends a very clear message about how important Instagram is 
um, for the strategy of Vogue International. And, um, and so I wanted to ask, why, why do you think Condé Nast got into stories and, and Vogue in particular? Like, what, what yeah. is the reason you had to be there? Yeah, so the, uh, in terms of this little new centralized team in London, it was interesting that they would bring on someone to look just at Instagram from the start. And I think it was partly that, um, you know, fashion and Instagram have gone together for a long time. When I was working there, um, the fashion industry were one of the first to adopt the platform and to really get it and get it. And fashion's very visual and um, fashion insiders started using the platform in really cool ways from the beginning. But for some reason, Vogue was not killing it on the platform in the way that it should have been. Yeah. So I think there was a kind of question of like, okay, how can we get Vogue, an incredible brand, um, an amazing kind of legacy media brand that has a lot of trust and a lot of people know it off Instagram to that, that status and that authority on Instagram as well because I'm sure a lot of you use Instagram and know that perhaps you get your kind of inspiration and style and, and ideas from different places. So I, I also thought that conundrum was quite interesting of, okay, how is it that this amazing brand is not necessarily killing it in the way that it should be on Instagram? And that's where I, I came in with a strategy which was, okay, let's look at everything that's going on here. Let's do an audit and kind of take a, take a step back and see what everyone's doing and, and take time to actually speak to all the editors and talk to them about what they're doing and then see if we can try and like raise that quality yeah. bar and take them to a new place and actually start telling stories in a way that's way more native to Instagram and yeah. is not just kind of taking the magazine and trying to just put that on the platform, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So I think in the first example, it's going to help illustrate this kind of big question of, okay, you've decided you're gonna go big on Instagram, you're gonna do it across all of these different languages. How do you attack this? Like, where do you start? So let's, let's go into the first yeah, example. Yeah, so I'd look at, so I talked about the first, the first way I started is actually not very sexy at all, <laughs> which is just lots of calls with the editors, getting on the phone to the different markets yeah. and actually understanding, okay, who are your teams running Instagram? How many people have access to the account? What's your strategy? What kind of content do you post? Once I'd got that kind of overview of all the accounts, then we started to look at, okay, can we elevate the content? So we took Fashion Month. And we said, okay, this is a great time to just experiment with a ton of content and see what sticks and what works for multiple Vogue's. Um, so I actually never thought that we were going to produce global stories when I joined. I thought that I would work one-on-one -on -one with the different editors on their accounts already. But it turned out there are certain stories that all the Vogue's wanted to run. Right. So I was like, okay, I can do something here. My, my back, I helped launch Instagram stories and you know, this is something that I knew that I could do. Like when you were at Instagram? When I was at Instagram. Right. So I was like, okay, I helped launch Instagram stories. I, I did the programming for our six international accounts here. This is 11 accounts, so it's a little bit more, but I think I can do this. So yeah. we started making these global stories um, and we started with Fashion Month. And one of the things that we tried were different kind of series ideas or franchises that you might yeah. call them. Um, one of the ones that was really popular, as you can imagine, is a franchise that we called Vogue Backstage. And this was this kind of perfect marrying of Instagram stories meets Vogue. You've got the exclusive access, and then you've also got this very raw ephemeral content. So I'm going to show you what that Vogue Backstage series looks like and give you an example here so you can uh, see what we're talking about. Let's see if we can move on. Hey, it's Jeremy Scott, you're backstage at my show in New York City for Fashion Week. Jeremy uh, so, so here's an example. This is back, backstage with Jeremy Scott at New York Fashion Week. Super visual, works really well for Instagram stories, uh, especially because he was using a lot of neon, which particularly works well. You can see that we, we're shooting it all on mobile video. It's a full bleed, you know, going in for the vertical video. Um, we work, we, we look really closely at the artwork, what we call the artwork. So, you know, text overlay, the use of neon pen, emojis, things like this, trying to figure out what makes those stories most engaging. We look really closely at completion rate. So how many people are actually watching from the first clip all the way to the end. So this is just a, that's just a very small taste of the type of series and content that I started producing for all the Vogue's. Um, and that, I mean, a lot of them weren't even doing Instagram stories before I joined. So that was just a great way to start elevating the content. And then as you said, 
Stories is really an area of investment for Instagram and it's a feature that they're putting a lot into and we know that the more people engage with your Instagram stories, the more they engage with your account and feed. So, so that was a very nice low-hanging fruit, yeah. as you would call it. Yeah. And then I'll just show you. So we, we took that to the next stage with Fashion Month that happened just this February, just gone in 2018. Um, and we said, okay, let's not just keep reinventing the wheel. We know that this Vogue backstage content does well. Let's just do that and do it better. So instead of kind of adding on loads of new series, we just took something we knew was working and just yeah. made it better. So here's an example of, of that content and some of the other stiff stuff we did um, at the Fashion Month just gone. Still lots of neon. That gives you a, a more of a, an insight into what we've been doing on stories across the 11 Vogues um, and how we just took that format that we knew was working and just really ran with it. And I must add that this is really low on resources. I think we had two people shooting a lot of the video content just on mobile. And then we had a, a kind of rotating person in London who would share that out um, beyond to all the 11 Vogues using, you know, sharing tools like Dropbox for assets, um, Slack for messaging. Um, so it really, it's, it was still quite bootstrapped in a very startup way, lots of iteration as we go. Um, and, and yeah, this, I will think we were going to talk a bit about data, but that's something yeah. that really informs what we do as well. Yeah, I was going to ask actually, you mentioned you look at completion rate and how, you had identified this as a format that worked, so kind of how do you know that it works? What data do you look at? And then when you think about this across 11 different Vogues, I, the question I had was kind of how do you, how much do you expect each local edition to look at the data themselves? How much is done just by you centrally? Kind of how do you handle data on such a big project across so many different teams? Um, data is hugely important, yeah. uh, especially with a platform like Instagram. It's very manual. I don't know if anyone here are social editors or social media producers, but... Hands up. <laughs> you probably empathize with me of having to pull a lot of this by hand. So, you know, and I'm doing this with 11, sometimes 22 Vogue accounts. So actually we go into the Instagram insights, which are on the mobile app for Instagram, and actually look at the unique video views for each story clip and pull that, and then we figure out the completion rate ourselves. Um, and then we go even more granular and look at, okay, when people are tapping out of the story, when do people exit, when do they tap back, tap forward, and that gives us kind of a little bit more of a barometer of how engaging is that particular clip, and if it's not engaging, we need to do it differently next time. So we were iterating as we go. After every fashion week, which is four fashion weeks over a month, we would do like a week look back at the data yeah. and say, okay, you know, face to camera intros do really well, or this needs to be more snappy, or we could be more engaging on how we do the, the first look at the clothing. So data is really important, and actually it's the only way that I can convince people to listen to me a lot of times, so um, I wouldn't uh, scrimp on the data, basically. So I just want to make sure I understood that right. You had a week of production for a fashion week, and then after each one you had an entire week of looking at the data, so as much time spent looking at the data as actually on actually, the production. Actually, this time I was a bit more savvy, okay. and I did the data as we went. 
Wow, okay. um, last Fashion Month, we did that, so we yeah. spent a week afterwards looking at it. Um, this time around, I was trying to do it as we went. Yeah. So we would pull the numbers every day, and then we would just spend one day at the end of each week mm. and sit together as a team, pull up all the stories that we'd done on the big screen, and then look at the data and be like, okay, that's interesting, so this nail art, kind of focus that we did or a beauty focus at this fashion week did really well and, and why is that and can we have a look a bit more at that? And it's really interesting because I feel like for a lot of, kind of newsrooms and, and media organizations data is almost an afterthought a lot of times and I'm going to write my piece and then maybe I'll look and see how it performed and in this case it sounds like it was so integral to actually planning and iterating that you guys spent a lot of time looking at well i mean data. instagram stories is very ephemeral right so if you're not looking at the data as you go like you you'll just lose viewers if if you start i always think of instagram stories that if you do one bad story then you probably run the risk of losing loads of engagement rather than if you just hold back and just keep doing really good stories then your engagement's just going to keep increasing so, and then I'll show you how, we, how this looked in feed as well. So um, we often try and make sure that there's a really nice syn synergy between what we do on Instagram stories and feed. So you'll notice that some of these videos you saw on the stories view, um, we would encourage the editors to actually tease the story in feed. And this worked really well for some of them. You'll see both of these examples are from Vogue India. They did a lot of this. So they chose some of the best clips of the stories and posted them in feed. Their engagement quadrupled. <laughs> Um, since six months ago, and all engagement across all the Vogue's increased by 25% over the two months between Fashion Month. Um, so I'm really excited about yeah. that. <laughs> At a time when a lot of people are seeing engagement on Instagram decline, yeah. um, I think that it's really exciting to take such a huge brand and, and really push their engagement and drive more, more followers to the platform. And we talked about, too, before, how you had the strategy of kind of establishing the baseline and then raising the bar, and it seems like producing this centrally and, and sharing it, exposing all the teams was really like an education piece. And, and that's the proof that that exactly. works. I mean, that what I'm doing is not, I'm not trying to be a, a production hub for the Vogue's because I could just hire 10 video producers and just produce a lot of content. Um, that's not what we're trying to do. It's more a kind of, this is what it could look like. This is an example of maybe something we should try. And then actually, most of the Vogue editors now will take these templates and just go and do their own local stories. Yeah. Um, but generally, the quality, and if any of you follow your local Vogue's and think that the quality has gone up, please come and tell me. <laughs> um, but I do think that anecdotally and from the data we're seeing that the quality of content across a whole family of Vogue accounts is now increasing. So this kind of um, the format of doing a best practice global story and then trying to encourage that from your local editor seems to work quite well. Um, it takes, yeah, so it takes us into the next example. In, in terms of quality, we also found that a series that worked well for us was this idea of getting a first look at collections before they hit the runway. So we cultivated a first Vogue, Vogue first look series, um, and here's an example. So this is seeing the costumes for the new Royal Ballet um, piece that were designed by Erdem. Um, we managed to get a Vogue first look at this. Um, really beautiful, Hi, really, um, uh, it's actually really Vogue ballet, content, yeah, even though it's dance. Uh, fashion covers all sorts of style, illustration, design. design. Um, and again, it works well across all the Vogue accounts. Um, super visual, our audience loves to see, you know, something that works. Again, like this for me just works really well in vertical as well. Um, and again, we're still capitalizing on what Vogue's unique selling point, so exclusivity, access, but then doing this more sort of first look, a slightly more lean back than you'd expect for stories, um, allows us to get a little bit more time to edit, um, to plan ahead, so this series works really well for us. And the most important thing for me as well is that these stories are really memorable, um, so I think, again, just going back to you know, Instagram stories being an important feature, you, you don't want to be that person that when they see you in the tray, they just swipe past. You want to be the one that people go, oh, yeah, I know Vogue Italia stories are awesome. I'm going to tap on that and see that today. So that's, that's what I'm aiming for with every time that we do a story. Um, this is how the Vogue first looks look across multiple Vogue accounts. 
So you can see that version that I showed you a minute ago, is, that's the version that we kind of offer to all the Vogues. And again, using this kind of structure of Dropbox, we give them a, a raw version of the file so that they can take the video files and do their own text overlay and their own artwork. So they'll all add a different local flavor as well. And this supplements stories that they're doing already. So they might also be doing backstage at their local fashion week that we're not covering, and they kind of implement that with some of these global stories as well. So I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so a lot of things that get people ask me kind of like, okay, how do you do this? Like what, what would be some more practical tips on producing this kind of content? Um, again, it's not so sexy, but planning <laughs> is really important. Um, having a master plan and having a kind of production plan really, really helps. Um, so here's an example of some of the things that I would make sure that you have before time. So I think a lot of people think with Instagram stories or visual content, um, even Vogue editors, that it's okay to just kind of go with no plan and just get your phone out and just point it at whatever's coming by and, and hope that you get some good in engagement and some good audiences looking at that. Um, I would say the more you can do with planning, the much more likely you are to get higher audience figures and unique views. Um, so yeah, here's an example I did um, as a template for BBC News, and they actually use these templates over and over now, but thinking about your audience that you're trying to reach with this story, what's your tone? Um, every story is going to be different. You might be trying to do something that's a bit more kind of for your loyal followers, or something might be trying to reach new followers. Um, so making sure that you actually get to the, the detail and the planning as well. And then here's storyboarding. Again, very traditional broadcast media kind of format. Um, but we need to learn this now. I'm, I'm not from broadcast, I'm from newspapers, but I have to, have to learn some of the tricks. So I actually go through every story that we're going to do and have a plan about how I'm going to shoot this, what kind of text and visuals I might add afterwards, because that's going to help you before you start editing, um, and then you know, go for it, and you might find that when you're there, you change this around, but actually having that plan and that shot list is something that I can fall back on when I'm you know, surrounded backstage by lots going on. You can just pull out your plan and be like, okay, I need to make sure that I get the makeup artist speaking to camera. I need that beauty shot up close. So making sure you have your shot list and your storyboard is really important for me when it comes to stories. It feels like this is something where clearly it takes a lot of time. And I think everybody doing stories would love to have the time to to be able to plan things out properly. And, and it's not that it's difficult necessarily, it's just that it's very deliberate the way that you're doing this. Which leads me to my question, it's probably expensive. And so how do you get buy-in from the higher ups to give you the time that it takes to actually do something this, this sophisticated? Yeah, I think it's good for everybody to have your arguments to hand for your superiors on why Instagram's important, and I've certainly had to argue that point a lot as well in, in multiple jobs that I've worked at. Um, everyone's going to ask the monetization question. Um, so yeah, make sure you have your arguments ready. My argument, if you care to hear it, is that um, Instagram for me is about branding and engagement and development, and that's something media industries really struggle to get their heads around. So in the fashion industry, it's something that's very innately understood is that there can be value transactions that don't have to be about money. Um, on, you know, in the newspaper industry, we, we kind of get a bit more fixated on, on the dollars and, and, and we want to see the kind of the direct connection. Um, I would go to your bosses and say, you know, talk about the branding, talk about the development, how increased engagement leads to more discovery, to more recognizability, essentially to a bigger brand reputation and then you can then start to talk about, okay, why that's important for whatever your KPIs are, whether it's footfall, subscriptions, this kind of thing. It's a hard sell. Like, yeah. it's a hard argument to talk about. Um, community and community development is something that a lot of people struggle to talk about with their CEOs and superiors. So I, I know it's difficult, but I do think it's something that as journalists that are using Instagram and working on Instagram, we have to take it upon ourselves to help people that we work with understand the value of the platform and why it's important. So I would encourage us all to do it because it will make everyone else's lives easier, I think. And I know your, your third example here is about community. I'd love to get into that because I think that there's clearly so much value in engaging directly with the audience. Yeah, it's something that I think, again, I've worked with a few media brands that kind of struggle to remember that Instagram is about community. Um, 
when I worked at Instagram, it was so obvious to me it was a community based platform, it always started, f it was made for individuals. Um, it wasn't actually made for brands, brands came right. on later. Right. Um, but as brands and as media brands, we have to figure out, okay, how do we deal with that tension? How do we kind of almost pretend to be a community member? If you think about it, a brand has a brand profile that people can follow, they can DM, they can comment as if they were an individual. Um, so I think recognizing that tension and remembering that Instagram was made for community members is a really good starting point for any media brand. And then, okay, how do you work with the community or, or pretend, not pretend, but kind of be a part of the community? Well, collaborate with them and actually bring them on board. So this is something I really wanted to encourage the Vogues to do, is actually be a good community player and find amazing community members. They're not competitors, they're people that you want to work with. Um, so one example is finding an illustrator, for example, that we want to, to work with to, to cover the, the red carpet dresses from the Golden Globes. It's a really simple example, um, but working with our community, especially in illustration, style, photography, beauty, instead of um, constantly sort of talking about us and Vogue and actually finding community members and giving them a platform, is a surefire way to make sure that we stick around for the next few years at least. So that's something that I've been trying to work with um, all the Vogue editors on, is helping them think about Instagram as a community platform. It's not just a place to broadcast about what editorial content we are doing. Um, it's somewhere where we can celebrate some of our amazing community members and people that we don't know about yet. Um, so this is, this is one of the things I've been doing with them. And the, the, the ways that you can do that are really simple, actually. Um, another example that we did was uh, a hashtag project called Dear Vogue. Um, this was for International Women's Day and we invited uh, community members to tell us about uh, items of clothing or accessories that make them feel empowered. Um, so here's one lady talking about her first jacket that she designed. So we asked those from the design, illustration, style, um, also photography, artists, um, and we had something like 33 submissions and we shared that across all the Vogue's on Pinterest and Instagram as also on the website. And again, it's just a really great way to shine a spotlight on your community and then that's gonna really build your, your core network. And if you can become the node in that network, that's really gonna ensure that you're, you're kind of future-proofing your, your brand as well on Instagram, which is essentially what I've been kind of brought on to do. So um, working with the community is really, really important. I know that for, for traditional media companies, the idea of having, or, or for journalists in particular, the idea of having the community kind of remix your work is, is almost heresy. I mean, that's like, you know, I'm a journalist and this is my professionally produced piece of work and having some amateurs or readers kind of go in and do something completely different with it, that, that sounds pretty scary. I, I think your next example is, is about these um, oh, yeah. illustrations of the covers that I think is really, really brave of Vogue to go into that space. And I wonder if you could talk about you know, why and how it's, it kind of continues on what you've just been saying. Well, a lot of people, when they say, oh, well, how do we work with the community? Or how do we get them to do stuff? I always hear that from journalists. It's like, how yeah. can we get the community to send us something or do a drawing for us yeah. or send us a photo. And it's like, it's not really about getting them to do things or to do stuff. It's actually about seeing what your community is doing already. And that people talk about social listening and these kind of buzzwords, but mm. it's actually just spending time with them and looking at how they're interacting with you. And the example I was gonna show was because I noticed um, that a lot of the illustrator community, which is really thriving on Instagram at the moment and in the UK, were responding to the, um, when Edward Enifel took over British Vogue, uh, they released the, his first cover, and community members started doing kind of versions of the cover that were really beautiful. So I went to that team and I said, look, this is crazy if you don't highlight this. This is yeah. such a great time to engage with some of your most loyal fans, your advocates for the brand, and actually get them on board from the beginning and show that you're there and listening and that you love their work. Um, and so they agreed and they said, you know, actually some of this work is amazing. It's better than what we could have done ourselves. <laughs> um, so they produced uh, these kind of Instagram carousels where they were highlighting some of the amazing versions of the cover. Um, really simple, like I think it took 30 minutes to pull this together. Um, and you tag people, everyone loves it, they screenshot it, they share it on their own profiles, they share it with their friends. And 
Um, I mean, I get the most buzz out of this kind of work, honestly. Like, I think, you yeah. know, just seeing how we can be part of something bigger on Instagram and part of a community that's already thriving is, it, this is the most important work I think I can do at Vogue. Um, you can, as I said, hire video journalists and just broadcast and broadcast, but that's really not going to get you to the place you want to be on Instagram. Everyone says, how do I get more followers, Hannah? How do I get more followers? And I want to talk about engagement. And I want to talk yeah. about community and the followers will come. So this is something that I would say to you, and it's how I talk to anyone who asks me generally, is you know, focus on your community and you will be in a good place on the platform. I think we're probably given time at a good place to open up to questions. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you want to finish off on before we um, open it up? I think that's probably it. I mean, the community aspect, I've obviously hammered it home a little bit, but I couldn't talk about a new project that we have coming, but do look out in the next couple of weeks for a very interesting community-focused project coming from Vogue. I wanted to be able to share it with you today, but it's not quite ready to launch. <laughs> Um, but it's Stay something tuned. that kind of tries to encapsulate everything I've been talking about. So um, definitely look out for okay. that one, and please DM me any feedback or thoughts about it as well. So yeah, questions. All right, great. So it's your guys' turn. We've got a question over here, Jim. <coughs> Thanks. Really cool stuff. Um, Jim Lauterbach from VidCon. Can you give me a sense of what the production process is like when you're out there? You show the storyboards and you show the shot list, but are you shooting everything on site and then shipping all the raw materials back to a producer in the office, or are you actually producing it and pushing it out right there on site? Yeah, so we experimented with two models, and the one that's working right now is shoot everything on mobile in vertical, you edit the clips on mobile yourself, or whoever the person is doing this. Um, and then we, we tested iCloud for sharing with a central production person back in London. That worked pretty well. It almost worked better than Dropbox because that was taking a long time to load, mm -hmm. uh, especially when you're backstage and the Wi-Fi is terrible. Um, and then the central producer back in London will um, package the content into kind of different folders, and we have been using Dropbox for that, and then use Slack to share that out with the Vogue team. So you'd have a folder that's the raw files, and then we do a version with artwork, and that's either the person who's backstage or the producer, depending on what the timing's like. So they would add all the text overlay, they'd write the captions, and then we'd put those into two Dropbox files. We'd give them a feed recommendation and a feed caption, and we'd send that all out. Does that make sense? Other questions? Thank you. Hi, um, Karen Fleeting from Trinity Mirror. Um, our regional titles, uh, we've recently sort of started exploring Instagram stories in a way that we weren't before. Um, so we feel like we're still experimenting, but still finding our way. And I wondered, you mentioned sort of the amount of time that you spent on data analysis, and also touched on sort of some of those KPIs, so the engagement time, uh, well, the engagement, the completion time. And I wondered, um, sort of, do you set benchmarks? Like, what does success look like for your various sort of Instagram profiles and, and feeds? Um, what kind of benchmarks do you set? What That's should we be really looking for? That's a really good question. I have like personal metrics <laughs> and then I have the, the company ones. So um, with the global stories, it's easy for me to kind of look at unique views. So Instagram gives you a reach number, which is your unique views for Instagram stories. So I can look at the total unique views for a story and quickly compare that to other stories we've done to see how successful it is. And then I do completion rates. So, um, you know, 70% of people watched first clip to end for the Burberry story, so I know that's really good because I, I know that anything above like 50 or 60 is really good. Um, and that's for us, but that's also across the board. So those are the kind of two metrics I'd look at. So reach um, and completion rate, which I, is my version of engagement for Instagram stories. But then for me as well, I have a much more qualitative metric, which is a year ago we had some UX research that where someone said, oh, Vogue doesn't get Instagram. Ooh. And I was like, oh, <laughs> harsh. Um, that's the kind of statement I wanted to move away from. Um, so now we can conduct more research and, and find out that um, people now think we do get Instagram, which is awesome. And we, you know, things like we've been nominated for an Inma Award based on our use of Instagram stories content for Fashion Month. Um, the fact that within the industry, 
um, people at you know, Dior, Gucci are coming to us backstage and being like, you're the guys doing Vogue Instagram stories, they're awesome, we love them. So you've got industry insiders, PRs coming and talking to us about that, but then you also have the community feedback of seeing the audience numbers and everyone responding saying how much they love the content. Um, so those are the slightly more qualitative um, things that I look at in terms of KPIs as well. But generally I'm just trying to really push engagement um, and I, I would encourage you to focus on engagement rather than followers because, as I mentioned before, if you look at engagement for Instagram stories and you really try and go for that, then your followers will come. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. What do you look at at Trinity Mirror? Well, something that we are looking at... Oh, got the microphone back. Um, something that we are looking at, um, in, in addition to... Um, unique viewers is um, with our Instagram stories sort of looking for the click-throughs to our sites but we're still trying to work out if that's a valuable metric if that's what we should be really targeting um, and if not then how we sort of justify the resource that we're currently putting into Instagram stories yeah that's we've also started looking at traffic from stories links but it's something that I'm trying to be slightly careful about if it starts to impact on the engagement, if we're really pushing that. But I know given the Facebook changes that a lot of people are pushing stories links and I think it's worth experimenting with and just see how it goes. But I'm also asking the question because I think um, measuring Instagram stories is a very new area <coughs> and I, it's really nice to I think just share within the industry what you're looking at and why it's important and, and share data even as well. So it's safe to say then that the, the primary goal of you guys doing Instagram stories is not to get click-throughs back, at least not at the moment. It's much no, more about it's engagement. Much, it's, about, uh, it's really about a branding piece. It's so that in 10 years' time, everyone on Instagram knows who Vogue is. Yeah. And we don't get forgotten. Yeah. That's it. Any other questions out there? Yeah. How do you Um, so you, you showed beautiful examples of like how you, uh, of content created by users. How do you do that? Do you do like campaigns with like hashtags? Is that how you guys go about it? Uh, well, the only hashtag campaign that I've done with the Vogue's is the Dear Vogue example that I shared. It's actually a very new idea for Vogue editors to do that, although I know loads of other publications have been doing kind of hashtag participatory projects for a long time. Um, we have, we curate and look for amazing talent on the platform all the time. Um, so actually we just reach out directly and say, we'd love to work with you on this. Or it's someone that we've worked with before or one of the Vogue's has worked with. So we kind of, again, the, one of the unique things about Vogue is that just all the editors have a bajillion people that they see of up and coming talent that they want to work with. And, and actually being able to harness that is probably the, the next big step in what I want to do. Um, a lot of them are working with amazing people all over the world, and, but we just don't know who they are. Um, and actually, if we know who they are, we can do more fun collaborative projects with them as well. Um, but I'd like to do more hashtag projects and things where we invite people to, to actually send in content or, or work with us in some way. And Dear Vogue is like the first example of that. Does that make sense? Other questions out there? Great. Yeah? All right. Thank you very Thank much, you Hannah. Thanks Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you, everyone.